We're ready. Okay. Welcome to the 30th meeting of the 2018 Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Um, just an update, we have an updated agenda to include correspondence from the government on the Ivory Bill. So that's now on the agenda. And before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. So the first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item five in private. Are we agreed? We are agreed. We are agreed. And the second item in the agenda is for the committee to take evidence on the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Bill, and this is the second of the committee's evidence sessions with stakeholders. I'm delighted to welcome our two witnesses this morning from Sweden. We have Stefan Neustrom, uh, Director of the Department for Climate Change and Air Quality in the Swedish Environment Protection Agency, and Anders Weikman, Chair of the Climate uh, Climate KIC, Stefan and Anders are joining us today via video conference from Sweden and welcome to you both. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. We'll, Good start morning. With, we'll start with questions around how the issue of climate change is currently been tackled in Sweden. And, um, I guess Scotland and Sweden have got similar topography and land uses like densely packed urban centres but with significant agricultural, forestry and other rural land uses as well. Can I ask uh, both of you in, in turn and, and just indicate who wants to go first, what have been the key challenges in developing uh, and implementing Sweden's environmental objectives and integrated, integrated climate and energy policy? Mm. Well, well <laughs> that's a you big start. question. Well I, well, I guess there are several, obviously, challenges. One of the main being that we're a small country. We depend for our prosperity on international trade and the issue of competitiveness in relation to how to maintain or increase standards in Sweden while at the same time facing competitors in other countries who may not do the same. Is this going to hurt our country and the competitiveness? Or are we going to have an advantage of it henceforward? Is this going to be costly or non-costly? How can we protect ourselves and how can we gain advantages in terms of competitiveness by doing this? So the pace of actually increasing the environmental standards in relation to competitiveness, I think, is one of the main issues. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, one advantage we have in terms of climate policy compared to many other countries is that we have a more or less CO2-free electric power system, a combination of hydro and nuclear. Um, nuclear is now gradually being phased out and replaced by increasing amounts of uh, renewable energy. Um, we uh, plan to uh, have that completed around 2040. Um, so that makes us a bit special in, in, in the European context. Uh, and we've had the discussions over the years whether we couldn't, uh, in fact, be a, a much uh, larger net exporter of electricity, helping countries like Poland and Germany close down some of their stations. Uh, so that, 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 that's an advantage for us. Um, your question was... Oh, you asked about environmental objectives in general. Um, there I would say the main, main challenge, I think, is to uh, uh, move from a situation where we have had more or less a silo-based approach, uh, trying to target environment goal, each environment goal, uh, their own rights. Uh, and now we realize increasingly that we have to do it much more in an independent fashion. And that goes for our environmental objectives, but it also goes for the development of the United Nations. I think this uh, vertical approach that so far has dominated with each ministry sort of focusing on, on their particular concerns is, is, is not really going to work. So it had to be a, a, a sort of a buy-in from all sectors working together in order for you to be achieving what you have. And that's exactly. obviously happened. 
Well, it has happened, yes. And I think the main difficulty, except for, for, for then these things that we've been speaking about, that has been politics, really, to, to uh, not make this a right or left issue, since it's not a matter of survival for the planet for obvious reasons. And we can see that technology is there to help us out. It's going to be cheaper and it's going to be competitive to use the better technology in the future. But, you know, to, to manage this political context where short-term squibbling is the main agenda for the day. That was the main challenge. But now we've got, you know, 87% of the Swedish parliament standing firmly behind this, these goals that we have. And at the same time, we have a long-term energy agreement aiming at a net zero, or actually a carbon dioxide free emission electricity production system by 2040. And we can see that this is going to happen already before 2040, because wind, is increasing so extremely fast in Sweden that it doesn't actually need any subsidies any longer. Was, you was, got our first... was, was, the, was the Paris Agreement the, the, the catalyst for this wider agreement, or was it already happening? Well, yes and no. I mean, we, we had this climate task force that was set up by the government in 2015, um, and our goal was to um, reach net zero emissions in 2050. But the Paris Agreement influenced that task force. So we moved the target date closer. Uh, so now we have a goal for, for 2045, net zero emissions. I would say if you ask for challenges and difficulties, I would say there are two, uh, two that I would specifically mention. One is now we have agreed around the targets and the goals, and that's of course the first step. But when it comes to implementation, um, I think we will we will experience a lot of difficulties, simply because the, there is a tendency in our country, but also in other countries, that the finance ministry is is most often using a discount rate that has a tendency to delay action because we the assumption is that we will be much richer in the future. This is really the, the, the old debate between Nordhaus and Stern already in 2006. Um, and I think um, the finance ministry most often is wrong. I think we should do things much quicker. And the most recent the IPCC report also speaks in favor of that. I mean, if you read that, that report carefully, the world at large has to reduce emissions by 50% till 2030 to have a chance to, to, to meet the, the Paris Agreement. So then we cannot cannot uh, cannot continue to delay action so that's one 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 difficulty the other one is to distinguish between incremental change which we have done so far cutting a few emissions year by year and now we we need, really need transformation because we we won't reach zero emissions or close to zero with incrementalists we need really to do transformation in several of the major sectors not only the energy system Cement, steel, aluminium, plastics, textiles is a horror story, electronics and agriculture. All these sectors, we have to do things in a totally different way. And that transformation, I don't think most people realise what it means. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to John Scott, Scott for the next couple of questions. OK, thank you, convener. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, well, Gillian has already touched on this. Um, I just want to note that Sweden has a long history of environmental protection with strong public support, public buy-in, as she said. So how have politicians and governments managed to achieve such a high level of support for decarbonisation and other environmental objects? How did you manage to persuade your public, your electorate, that this was a good idea? Uh, thank you, sir. I think it's a combination of several issues, as Luck. always. <laughs> Luck. <laughs> well, the uh, Paris Agreement of obviously offer a window of opportunity for taking long-term action instead of the short-term action, which is often dominating the political agenda for obvious reasons. But then again, we saw that technology was around the corner to help us decrease emissions from large sources in Sweden, which wasn't perhaps there before. You can see that in the mining and mineral, mineral, minerals industry, for example, they've now put an action plan before, before us to become uh, fossil free by 2035. And that's a large emitter in Sweden. Steel industry alone accounts for 10% of our emissions 
more than 5 million tonne. Now there's a plan from this industry by itself to become fossil free as soon as possible, but possibly around 2035. And the list is long. So actually, the general understanding of the fact that climate change is going to harm our economy and it's going to hurt us badly all if we don't take action. It's been widespread in the Swedish society, spurred by the climate agreement in Paris, and then translated into action both in terms of political goals, but also action plans from, from, from the commercial side. And that has helped a lot. And also, for obvious reasons, as you stated yourself before, there's a long term uh, long, a long tradition of uh, awareness in Swedish society. So all, the whole process has been chaired, so to speak, and spurred by the uh, non-governmental organizations who wanted us to go further. And that has also helped. So that there has been a movement in general since the window of opportunity opened up by a combination of the Paris Agreement and technological change, which but, was facilitated the transition. But, but I interpreted your question maybe a bit wider, because you asked about the historic um, development. And I would say, I mean, we are, we are in a rather special situation, as I said before. Uh, we are a small population on a very large land area. We have lots of forests, uh, so we can use biomass um, cleverly if we, if we, if we, if we need. Uh, we have the hydro capacity, and then for a number of reasons, not, not related to climate change mitigation, Sweden took a decision in the 1960s to develop nuclear energy. Hadn't we done that, we would have been 40 to 50 percent dependent on fossil fuels for our electricity production. But that was a decision mostly because of um, um, energy security at that time. I mean, you may recall the, uh, the oil crisis in the beginning of the 1970s. I was at that time a member of the Swedish parliament and that whole issue was, was, was very much dominating uh, the energy policy debate. How can we become less dependent on, on, on the outside? Um, and the nuclear energy was also seen by industry as uh, uh, a very cheap way uh, to, to produce electricity. Um, and, and in retrospect, you could say that yes, for a, for a period of time it was, but now when we include the costs for uh, waste disposal and, and, and the long-term uh, management of, of nuclear waste, um, that's no longer true because uh, the, the, the fee that uh, reactor owners have to pay for, for uh, per kilowatt hour to, to, for that disposal is increasing as we speak. So, so, so things have changed a lot, but, but that is, I think, an important background. Mm. Sure. Um, thank you very much. Um, I hear what you say. Um, my next question is, um, Sweden's integrated climate change and energy policy has set testing interim and final targets for uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. What process was followed to pass this legislation and what key factors did you consider when deciding on the targets themselves? You spoke about this earlier, the, the, as part of the beginning part of the process to set the targets. But, what key factors did you consider when deciding on the targets? Mm. Well, were you asking about both the targets in the, uh, in the energy sector for 2040 and the climate change goals? Um, both uh, or either, whichever you prefer to talk about. I say thank you, uh, because I think they are, they are connected in a way and there's been tremendous amount of academic work being done in close relation to both uh, the government policy side, but also to, um, to, to, to industry. And behind the whole energy, uh, the system of energy goals was a job carried out by the, Swed the Royal Swedish Engineering Sciences uh, the academy. academy. And they worked for like three years, more or less, going into various looking upon the possibilities of becoming fossil free by 2040 and uh, at the same time we had a group of politicians very closely following this work and it opened up for a common understanding that this is possible it's not going to be costly 
rather it's going to serve our country well, since we saw early on that, for instance, wind power is going to increase tremendously fast in our country. Since we now have a market-based incentive system, which is also part uh, of the whole equation. It was launched in 2003. 2006, uh, generally Sweden produces about 160 terawatt hours per year, consume around 140 to 145. And the, in 2006, we produced our first terawatt hour of wind energy. Today, we're going to get And uh, the, we think that we're going to produce like 30 terawatt hours in 2021 already with the decisions that has been made. So the transition is very fast and costs has come down to below what it would cost to introduce new coal power fired station uh, power plants or for that matter, new nu nuclear. So wind power is going to <coughs> dominate our energy system by 2040. It's gonna be the new nuclear, so to speak. And this was an important part for getting the politicians to agree upon the energy goals for 2040. And of course, this was done in a parallel to the process that Anders and I worked with, with setting the climate goals, because they are very much interconnected. If you can't get a carbon dioxide free energy system, or at least electricity production system, then it's going to be difficult to reach the goals for the transition in the transport sector, which need zero uh, electricity, zero emit emitting electricity production systems. So, that, so much for the energy system. I don't know if you want to continue with the uh, climate process, Anders. Well, I, I think the first decision we took, uh, we were leading this talk, task force, was to make sure that each and every member of the committee, representing seven different political parties, that they had more or less the same understanding of the challenges. So we spent about half a year uh, to listen to experts, to travel around Sweden, talk to people, uh, deep dives in, in, in particular sectors to try to understand what, what are really the challenges and what are also the opportunities in terms of technology, in terms of substitution, etc. Um, and the energy system, as Stefan said, was of course one critical area. Uh, and there, electricity is now more or less, I would say, uh, in, uh, under control. Um, and we look forward to a rather rapid electrification, at least of the um, uh, of, of private vehicles, uh, the heavy heavy traffic is, is something where you still have a big question mark. Will electricity be the, the solution or will hydrogen be the solution or synthetic biofuels? We, we don't really know. Uh, we have to have an open mind. Um, uh, so, so uh, but then we look to um, other sectors that are of particular importance and I already refer to materials, base, basic materials. Most people don't talk about it, but uh, uh, by and large, uh, basic materials make up 20% of global emissions. And demand for basic materials, cement, steel, etc., are going up like this, in particular in developing countries. So unless we address that issue and look upon it as a responsibility of a country like Sweden to try to provide the world with uh, new technologies, I think uh, the Paris Agreement is, is, is never going to be met. So it's not only an energy, energy system issue, it's, it's very much a, an infrastructure material, basic material issue. And there we, are, there we have some, some policies in place to try to incentivize change. Um, then, of course, the uh, agriculture sector is critical. Uh, and we talk a lot about meat and meat consumption, but I would say Every, t every time we put the plow in the soil, we release a lot of carbon. And we have more and more evidence from different parts of the world, in particular the US, Australia, but also West Africa, that a combination of rotational crops and no-till agriculture is, is to be preferred because you build up fertility in the soil, you, you hold soil erosion, and you start building carbon in the soil. So you can absorb carbon from, from the atmosphere. Uh, we, we have not been able to... I would say, convince the agriculture sector yet about this. <clears throat> Not to speak of the, of the common agriculture policy not being prepared <clears throat> for the next phase. So I would, I would single out that as a very important issue. And if Sweden and Scotland and, and uh, some other countries, France in particular, could cooperate in Brussels to, to have a breakthrough to start incentivizing farmers 
to do the right things, to start building up carbon. I think that's, that's going to be critical. Uh, so, so, so those were some of the other areas of, of importance. Of course, then you have also city planning. I mean, to, to move from a situation where we have cars all over the place, where public transport, biking and, and walking is, is, is the primary mode of, of transportation, that, that, that is a major issue uh, over the long term, of course. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm just declaring an interest as a farmer myself. And I think that you have identified, I'm interested to hear you say, you've identified something similar to what we've identified in Scotland, that while our agriculture industry is probably prepared to shoulder its share of the burden, they have yet to have it demonstrated to them by those who have the technology or the ability to tell them how this should be done. And there's a, there's a, a, a situation where a lack of knowledge transfer is very much the the situation here yeah. in Scotland. Would you say it's the same in, in, in Sweden? Yeah, I don't, want to, uh, I don't want to sound condescending, but uh, I mean, the, the agriculture sector is a bit conservative, I guess. Uh, uh, and and I, I think it's been rather slow uh, uptake of these ideas. I would, I would suggest that you invite uh, Professor David Montgomery from the US He's recently written a fascinating book called Growing a Revolution, where he shows with a lot of examples from the Midwest in the US, the benefits of, of, of what he calls regenerative or conservation agriculture. And I think, I think we need pilot schemes, pilot demonstration projects for, for farmers to see with their own eyes. Yeah. Um, it, because it's, it's of course a risk taking to move from what you're doing today to something totally different. But I think the benefits are, are absolutely crucial. Then, of course, um, soils differ in different parts of the world. So, so, I mean, you have to apply this, this sort of new approach differently. But, but I think basically this, this, is, this is a very interesting area. Thank you very much. I have a short supplementary question from Mark Ruskell. Um, yes, uh, morning. Um, can I just go back to the, the energy questions again? Um, you have a really ambitious target. Um, to effectively remove fossil fuels from your, your heating systems by 2020. Um, so it's an area where we've particularly struggled with in Scotland, and I'm just wondering what, what you deploy. Is it biomass? Is it uh, electrical heating? Uh, is it district heating? Um, you know, how, how did you get to that point? Combination. Well, it's a combination of, uh, of uh, all the issues you mentioned. And we have very little fossil fuels left already in, our, in that sector. It was decreased tremendously during the oil crisis in the 70s by a very conscious uh, policy to do so. And uh, today there's, there's very, very little left. So it is an ambitious target, obviously, but I think we're going to be able to reach it, at least by 2021, perhaps not by 2020. Well, we, we have also district heating to a larger extent than most of Europe. I think around 55% mm. of the households are connected to district heating. Uh, so that has helped because it's an efficient, efficient system. And, and in parts of the country, we have combined heat and power, which means that you use the biomass or whatever, whatever uh, energy source, you would use it more, much more efficiently. Then we have, uh, over the years, an increasing number of heat pumps that has taken over. Um, and that means also in, in some parts of Sweden now that district heating is facing um, some, some difficulties because uh, the, uh, the energy demand is, 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 is being reduced. So, so they have to develop new business models. Um, so, so those are, I think, the, the, the main, uh, the main uh, responses. Um, Um, thank you, Kamina. Thank you, Kamina. I just wanted to come back to farming since we'd uh, gone to that subject, uh, where farming impacts three of the uh, seven greenhouse gases that uh, are internationally recognised. Carbon dioxide, which we talked about in tilling. Methane, of course, which comes from uh, bovine uh, sources mainly, uh, but of course is not particularly persistent. But the one I just wanted to ask about, if we can get an answer, is on nitrous oxide, which persists for over 100 years, which essentially 
uh, a large source of nitrous oxide is now from the production of fertilizers, artificial fertilizers. Um, uh, it, it does come from transport and other things as well, but for farming, they're a big source through fertilizers. And I just wondered if uh, Sweden had done very much work on identifying alternative sources of fertilizers to help farmers um, and possibly even reduce their dependence on artificial fertilizers and perhaps reduce costs, as well as, of course, uh, uh, providing uh, the climate change benefit, whether Sweden has done anything on that particular subject. Well, uh, I don't think any one of us is particularly uh, an expert on this. Um, incidentally, I met with uh, a Swiss uh, expert the other week, Hans Herren, who is uh, uh, head of the Millennium Institute, which uh, is, is active all over the world, advising farmers. Um, and he gave a talk in, at the big conference uh, and, and basically said that... Uh, he, 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 he looks forward to a phasing out of traditional conven uh, or conventional uh, fertilizers um, by, by changing farming practices. Um, perhaps not in, in, in parts of Africa where you've had tremendous soil erosion and, and loss of, of, of nutrients, but uh, I, I think there, 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 there are some uh, new developments, but, but I cannot say that, that we have been... Uh, um, champions of it in Sweden, um, okay. at least not too much. So I'm sorry about that. Okay. And then but I, another thing that, sorry. That I, that another thing I ran into the other day was an article, um, and that was very interesting. That you can reduce methane from from uh, cattle by mixing um, some seaweed with with the with the with the fodder. Um, so that that's that's very it's very interesting. So so there is that there's obviously it's quite a lot of technology development going on. Thank you. And then we move on to a question from Angus Macdonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Um, good morning, uh, gentlemen. You you may be aware that in Scotland our climate change plan is published every five years, uh, which sets out how emissions will be reduced over the following fifteen years, uh, in seven key sectors. So. Um, perhaps you could tell us uh, how Sweden approaches and reports on sectoral uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Thank you. Under the new Swedish climate law that was launched the 1st of January, which was the result of the work that Anders and I carried out, uh, the government must produce such plan each fourth year. So. The idea is that uh, if you say that year zero is the year of election, and in Sweden we have elections where the government has a mandate period for four years, then they will receive from all the authorities uh, the, the, the relevant statistics in the beginning of the first year of, the man, of their mandate period in order to have as much time to, to, uh, their, for, them, for them to produce uh, an action plan for the coming four years. And uh, it is the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency that gathers all the materials from the various sectors, produces that statistical analysis, and then hands over to the government. So we produce a lot, and we also do that on an annual basis. So you can, for each year, see how the, the uh, emissions develop within the various sectors. But each year, an action plan will have to be presented to Parliament by the government. And we have, like in the UK, we have a climate change committee that sort of is an independent voice and that is supposed to comment on uh, the, the government's bill, um, both positively and negatively. Uh, and I s assume we'll also come up with their own proposals uh, if they think the government is not doing, doing their job. But this is relatively new, so... so um, we don't really know how it will work yet, but we were inspired to a large extent by the British law. Um, and we visited London in November 2015. Um, and I think that visit with uh, Lord Devon or John Gummer uh, was very instrumental in convincing some of the members that uh, the idea of, of a special law or legislation uh, was a good one. 
Okay, thank you. I'd like to go back to talking about some of the areas in which it's been a little bit sticky, the difficult, the difficult sectors to move. And we, we obviously have a similar situation in, in Scotland that you've, you've described as well. We've been reducing our emissions, but a lot of that has been down to closing a coal-fired uh, power station. We, um, I, I'd like to take you back, and, and Anders, you've particularly mentioned construction, you've mentioned agriculture. I mean, what other sticky, difficult to change sectors are there? But more importantly, what strategies have been put in place in order to facilitate change in those sectors? Let's see if we can share a picture with you. I'll try and do this. See how... Uh, no, that's not... No, uh, it doesn't want to help us here, does it? Well, we're seeing, we're seeing well, you. I'm just seeing policy instruments. Is that what we should be seeing? Uh, no, it's supposed to be a picture showing where we have the large emission, emitting sectors and how the Swedish... Uh, yeah. But I think we can give you... Don't, don't worry, you can, you can send it on and we can put it into our, uh, our evidence yeah. as a supplementary if yeah. you want to just talk us through it. Well, sure. let, let's let's start then with with m m steel, which is, as Stefan indicated, roughly ten to fifteen percent of our uh, yearly emissions. Uh, there, the government has offered a special special package uh, to the steel industry. Um, so they have now a, a major project ongoing to try to develop uh, go from today's steel production technology to using hydrogen in the future um, for the oxygen, oxygen reduction. And they uh, are quite optimistic that this can happen uh, before 2035. Um, I met with them a couple of weeks ago and I said, couldn't we speed it up? And they said, of course, if you provide us with more, uh, um, more, more capital, more, more financial resources, we could probably do it within 10 years. So, so that's, that's one example. Cement in the, the cement industry is another challenge. Um, there I, I'm a little bit um, at a loss because on the one hand, I don't know if you saw, but Chatham House came out with the report about a month ago, basically saying with present knowledge, we believe we can cut emissions from cement production by 45 to 50% over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, then when I meet with the high, high senior officials in, in companies like Holcim Lafarge, they sort of indicate that we already know how to produce cement CO2 free, but that technology is too expensive. It doesn't mm. fit with our, within our business model. So I think there, there we have to really try to understand what we could do in the economy to incentivize that. Mm. But steel and cement are two very important areas. The third one is, of course, plastics. Um, and there, um, I mean, I think we, we would depend a lot on what's going on in the European Union context, where the Commission has taken on quite, a, quite an, uh, an ambitious role in, 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 in that whole uh, area. I would say also that some, some consumption um, sectors, like textiles and electronics, to me, are very problematic. Uh, we talk about the circular economy, but we, we should remember that less than 1% of uh, fibers from textiles are being recycled. Um, and that sector alone amounts to 6 to 7% direct and indirect carbon emissions in the world. So it's a huge, huge challenge. Mm. And, the, and, the, and the fashion, um, uh, the, the way fashion is being um, um, offered, um, you know, where people buy new stuff all the time is definitely not sustainable. So here consumers have to do their part, but, but the industry has to do a lot. Mm. Electronics is the same. If you look at, at um, my telephone here, uh, I cannot even change the battery. Um, and the plastics involved are glued together, so it's very difficult to recycle high quality plastics. So basically today, the only uh, materials that are being recycled and reused are copper and gold. Mm. 
the rest is incinerated. So, so we have a huge problem because th this sector is, 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 is increasing so fast. So, so I think there are, there are areas where we don't have any policy instruments yet that, that are effective. Those are obviously very difficult issues. If I could complement by looking at the territorial emissions, can you see the picture now shared with you, which says transformational change needed? Yes, we can. Excellent. The, the lower part shows industry, and then the red one is transport, and then the green one is agriculture. And if you look to 2045, you can see that what's going to be left in relation to our aims and the goals that we've set is going to be emissions from agriculture and from industry. Uh, we can see that there is, it is going to be difficult, primarily within the agricultural sector, to come down with the current knowledge. We have around the corner technologies that, that, that might be efficient, but we don't really know if they can deploy it so far. But then again, carbon capture and storage, unfortunately, I'd say, would be necessary in order to achieve our goals, because as Anders indicated, the cement industry with 5% of the Swedish emissions, looking at what, what is being produced within Sweden and the uh, territorial emissions, you can't go lower than perhaps a reduction of 50%, then you need the transformational change and it's just not there except for carbon capture and storage. So we say from the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency that it is needed to develop, we need to develop the CCS infrastructure, not alone for obvious reasons, but in a European context. And since Norway holds what they claim to be 30 to 40% mm -hmm. of the total known possibility, storage possibilities, it's obviously neighboring countries with whom we, co we cooperate very closely at the moment. And also when it comes to the later half, what's not shown in the graph here, 2050 and beyond, we need negative emissions. And Sweden is well endowed with forests and we have around 30 million tons of biogenic emissions from, from, from uh, the forest industry, for instance, which if we could store them in proper CCS fertility or BEX facilities, would produce those negative emissions, but we haven't seen them materialize as of yet. They're waiting around the corner and everybody's speaking about them, but they're not really uh, really there yet. And we need them by 2030 to 2035 in order to materialize the goals for the cement industry, but also to achieve the goals which are not yet set, but which needs to be negative emissions on, on the latter end of the, the century. Okay, Stuart Stevenson. Um, I've got a couple of relatively technical questions that have come out of uh, what uh, you've been saying. Uh, the first in relation to cement uh, and uh, the use of carbon capture and storage in that industry, which is, is something that's being discussed uh, to a limited extent uh, here. But of course, they, they, that requires a, a post-processing uh, extraction of um, carbon dioxide uh, from the emissions from uh, from the, the cement industry. And largely that is through uh, washing uh, the gases with a nitric acid bath. And that takes us straight back to nitrous oxide being a precursor chemical for producing nitric acid. And I, I just wondered if there are other carbon capture uh, and storage technologies that are being looked at, because I know of seven different technologies that yeah. there are. A number of them, of course, are pre-combustion, where you get the right amount of oxygen in, and et cetera. But cement is, I th unless I misunderstand, is a post-processing extraction process which relies on nitric acid. Uh, has Sweden done anything that might help on that? I, I don't think so. Um, there, there is a project run by the Norwegians for the cement industry. Uh, and uh, the Swedish cement industry is somehow partnering with, with that project. But uh, I must say, I, I, I need, need, none of us have, have visited that, that installation. Um, no, I'm about to go there in December, but unfortunately, I think we unable to answer your question. Well, that, 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 that's fine. I recognised it was quite a technical question. And the other one is also quite technical in that we, we touched on the electronics sector where the most recent gas added to the, the portfolio, um, nitrogen trifluoride, is a, a key 
part of the process of producing microchips, um, a key part of the electronics industry, and I think that's where most of it comes from. And again, I just wondered if uh, uh, there is uh, any understanding of, of how we might eliminate nitrogen trifluoride from the production industry there. Although, of course, I make the, the sort of small caveat um, as the gap between uh, components on silicon-based chips have now reached the limits of what works. Uh, we may well be moving to a different uh, base material, which isn't silicon, where there may be other things. But I don't. I know so little about that that I'm going to make very little comment on it. Have, have Sweden done anything on that as well? I don't think so. Uh, basically, because we don't have uh, an industry in this field, <clears throat> so so. Um, it's it's not it's not sort of part of our territorial emissions. We import all those stuff. So so, uh, but I I, I I think your question is very important, um, and it's something for uh, the Americans, for the Chinese, uh, for the uh, Koreans, etc., to really to really address. Um, but but I don't think we have any particular knowledge about it. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. We we, we should move on then. Camilla. Just coming back on some of the the information you gave me in response to my earlier question about the, the, the difficult to reach sectors and the issues that are around there. Now, in your, in your uh, graphic there, of course, transport was mentioned, and that's obviously a, a, a difficult sector. And, and largely will depend on a change in behaviours and behavioural change of, of the, the people of, of Sweden and Scotland in order to, for us to reach those goals. What, what's been done to affect those behavioural changes? With particularly, you know, with people's lifestyles. Well, uh, that is a tricky issue, and the going into behavioural issues from a political point of view, extremely tricky, since we're living in free world, so to speak. So politicians are a bit hesitant to really uh, go, go for that. We've rather done a lot of incentivising, um, taking incentivising actions in order to to facilitate for people to do the right thing, so to speak. So, for instance, on the car issue, there is a subsidy of 60,000 Swedish crowns, approximately 5,000 5, pounds, for buying a new car, a zero-emitting car. And that's obviously a behavioral issue, but through incentives instead of, of information or, or punishment, so to speak. And we have the same for fuels, but you know, people in general, don't really have to, to worry about that in a, in a sense. <laughs> we have then uh, a law demanding through a market incentive based system, which is kind of difficult to explain, but suppliers of the fuels for private vehicles need to increase the uh, bio part of the fuels that people actually, that is set on the markets. So it's going to be increased from 20 to, to 30 to 40 to cent over the years to come in order to facilitate the transition. And then again, we have the electric vehicle issue where we have incentive programs to uh, facilitate charging all over the country, both in terms of public charging, but also incentives for providing cheaper private charging facilities in people's homes and also at their work. Then again, going back to your original uh, question, the sticky issues, also t turning to international transport. The, the most difficult part of all, perhaps, is the international aviation. You know, in Sweden, if you look at the, the consumption emissions and territorial emissions all together, affecting the exports, we're at about 11 tons per Swede as today. Territorial emissions are around five, six tons, so it's almost a double. And a large part of that comes from international aviation and it's increasing tremendously fast. You know, just one travel from Stockholm to Thailand, for instance, which is popular during Christmas and New Year's New Year, emits two tons of CO2 per person. In economy. Sorry? In economy. In economy. Yeah. yeah in economy. In, in that, business, it's, 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 it's three, three times months. more. <laughs> and that's a really tricky <laughs> issue which we really need to tackle together. And we feel, on the authorities of Sweden, the answer that's come up so far on this tricky issue by the airlines, the companies themselves, namely Corsia, the international system for reducing the increases 
in emissions from 2027 by offset. It only addresses around well, between 15 and 20 percent of the overall emissions because of all the exemptions and loopholes that there are in the system. So we're really worried about this and we have no real solution to it other than a deepened international cooperation between all countries really. Okay. But, but add, adding to that, <clears throat> I mean, behavior is, is, of course, changing from one type of car to another that is, that is cleaner. That, that's that's so, sort of a positive thing. But uh, I would say that what, what has happened over the last five to ten years is that an increasing number of cities uh, are offering uh, much more efficient public transport uh, opportunities. Um, smart mobility is catching on. Uh, I don't think any Swedish city is in the lead. I think Helsinki and Lyon are the, are the two cities in Europe that, that have the most uh, efficient system. It, it, and, and the idea is to make it very easy to go by public transport and to be able to purchase your, uh, your ticket uh, through your mobile phone. There's an interface with, with, the, with, the, with, pay, with the paying system. <clears throat> um, and I, I'm also seeing quite a lot of, 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 of new carpooling systems where you can use an app and just order a car. You don't need a car if you live in the city. Uh, so you can have a combination of biking, public transport and, and uh, car on demand. So these are, these are systems that develop quite nicely. Mm. Um, and I think those will help. Uh, bring about behaviour change. But Anders, um, as you mentioned, we mentioned very early on in, in the discussion, Sweden, like Scotland, has a massive rural population as well. I mean, you can do these things in the cities, but what are you doing rurally to give people as, um, access to, to the public transport that's going to make it easy for them to change their behaviours with regard to using their yeah. car? Is that, is that a big issue in Sweden? That is a big issue, and uh, we, we see um, a very clear division between the rural areas and the cities, at least as people living in rural areas for understandable reasons. Yeah, that just doesn't all, only have to do with the possibility of transport for obvious reasons, but rather with education and with jobs, where the jobs are, they move to the cities and to the, the centre parts of, of countries. Uh, but then again, if you go back to the possibility of transporting yourself in the rural areas, our analysis is that the uh, introduction of electric vehicles will actually give rural areas an advantage. Because today it is an issue in Sweden which is very vast, obviously, and scarcely populated to the north and to the northwest. Our country is over 2,000 kilometers long and uh, 600 kilometers wide at the most. And, uh, you know, if the gas station closes down, together with the school and together with the, with the store, there is no possibility of, of staying in those rural areas. But then again, two holes in the wall, mm. charging your electric car, everybody has it. So the infrastructure is already there. So in that sense, we believe that the rural areas are going to be winners in the transition to electric cars. We'll see if that comes around, but it will at least take away the discussion on Will the gas station close down or will it be there and should it be subsidized by the government? Yeah. We're going to see that discussion coming to an end, I think, in the, in the coming five years. Okay. But keep in mind that 80% of uh, travel by car in Sweden does take place in, in the city right. uh, environments. So, so uh, e even if this is, is, a, is a political issue, and the sort of a divide between rural and, and, and areas and cities, uh, from, a, from an emission point of view, it's, it's, it's a minor, minor problem. Okay. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Good morning to you both. Um, could I turn our discussion to the emissions trading schemes? And um, for, the, for the official record, you'll of course know that Sweden has put targets in place for 2030 of 63%. 2040 of 75% and 2045 for um, 100%. I hope I'm correct on that. Um, so why do these targets differentiate between EU ETS and non-EU uh, ETS sectors? Uh, could you provide, um, if possible, a simple explanation of what sectors are covered under each target? And are there any flexibility measures 
available to achieve these targets. Thank you. Well, I mean, around 40 to 45 percent uh, of our emissions are covered by the ETS. So that's, that's heavy industry. Um, and, and one of the suggestions from the task force where we were, in, were involved uh, was really to, to make the ETS much more ambitious than, than what it was at the time of, of the report, uh, when the report was launched. So, so, I mean, we are not leaving the ETS sector uh, on its own, uh, but we cannot really influence the ETS uh, apart from being part of the decision-making process in Brussels. But all the other emissions we can, by and large, control uh, by pipe policy measures. And the 63% happens to be a compromise. I think some, some wanted 70%, some wanted 55 and then we ended up at 63%. So, so that's, it, it's, not, uh, it's, it, it's not easy to explain why it's just, why it's that particular percentage. But, but we, 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 we wanted to move towards zero in 2045. Uh, and then we, we made the, um, the calculation that, that 63% for 2030 was, was appropriate. Of that, 70% uh, 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 reduction goes for the transportation sector, which is a major part. Now, there is an intricate arithmetic behind those 63%, which we won't go into, uh, as you said, Anders. But the main simple explanation is that we rely on ETS delivering the reduction of uh, the, the reductions that it's set out to do and uh, we don't want any double steering so to speak uh, so we uh, we have confidence in ETS delivering and then if it doesn't we need to work via Brussels or together with like-minded countries to see to it that it will deliver but we should we should add that for instance what I referred to the uh, government uh, scheme to incentivize technology change in the steel sector is, of course, an example where we don't, we don't believe that the ETS alone will bring about the necessary technology change, basically because the price has been so low. So you need complementary measures. Mm. Uh, what we have seen over the last couple of years is, of course, that ETS seems to work better. Price has gone up, so uh, it should become more and more of an incentive for com companies to, to look for, for, for innovation, uh, which it was not when the price was around seven, eight uh, euros per ton. Mm. And to, to elaborate a little bit on, on that, when it comes to particularly the steel industry, which, is, which has always been very important for, for Sweden, we have around six billion pounds in net exports from the steel industry, which is a fair lot to, to us as a small country, uh, it's not enough for the ETS, as, as Anders says. We need a complementary innovation policy, because even if the price was high in the ETS sector, it would only empty uh, the pockets of our large steel producers, because it takes such a long time to innovate and to put in place new innovative zero-emitting steel production methods. And in this sense, when it comes to the, these large transformational uh, changes. You need public participation together with industry in order to share risk and for the public to contribute to finance. This is also what's happening. We have a special company. Which, well, we have three companies working together. There's a steel company, there's an electricity production company, there's also a mining company that works together. Two of them are publicly owned and the other one is private, uh, privately owned. And uh, this is probably going to be needed in other areas as well, which ones we don't know as yet. But then again, competition is fierce out there on the international market. And if change takes more than, <laughs> more than a quarter of a year, when, when stock markets want return, you may need to share risk to contribute to finance from, from the public. Thank you. But uh, as a policymaker, um, I would make the point uh, to you that, you know, it's very interesting. If you, if you compare the price of a ton steel that is conventional and one that is CO2 free, the price difference is probably something like 40 to 50%. Uh, when you sell the steel, 
So that's, then you are not competitive. But if you look at, at, at when you're buying a car, if the steel would be CO2 free in the car, the, that car would cost maybe 100 pounds or 200 pounds more, not, 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 not more. Uh, so the difference at the consumer level uh, is, is very, very minor. Um, and I would hope that we could somehow um, manipulate uh, or do something in the economic system so that that differential uh, would not play out the way it does today. Mm. Uh, pre preliminary research <coughs> results, as I indicates, show that the uh, cement would be like 50% more expensive and steel as well. I think it's 60 and 40, but it's 0.5% on price, uh, for instance, rail, rail construction material or a house by cement and steel. If you consider, for instance, an apartment in central Stockholm being constructed, the price of which would be around 500,000 pounds, the extra cost would be, the incremental cost would be like 2,500 pounds, which is nothing, really. So we are asking ourselves also how we can use public procurement in order to incentivize, incentivize uh, our industries to provide us the net zero cement and zero steel. Could, could you just explain uh, briefly how um, public procurement um, would help with those, um, those sectors? One, one of the largest buyers of cement in Sweden is the authority responsible for building new highways, new bridges and uh, new railroads. Is, uh, and the demand for cement and steel from that particular agency is very high. And if they introduce gradually or directly or, you know, in, in, in close cooperation with the companies, a demand for zero CO2 cement, mm -hmm. incentivizing a large company, which has about 96% of the Swedish market, by the way, uh, to do so, this could be an equation that works out. 50% of uh, new uh, apartment buildings are built by uh, municipalities. Mm. Uh, and one of, the one of the proposals from us was to build high-rise buildings in wood. Uh, we have a lot of wood uh, in Sweden. And uh, those, uh, those buildings or houses are cheaper, they are quicker to erect, and I would say they are also more beautiful. Um, concrete buildings are not... Um, something I'd like <laughs> very much. So, so I mean, there, there are many, uh, many opportunities for public procurement. And the public procurement legislation in the European Union now allows for these kind of, of um, um, uh, demands to be, to, to be brought forward. I think the critical issue is the competence among the public procure, procurement officials, because they, they do not only have to be conscious about the legislation and the uh, legalistic aspects, but they have to be conscious also about technology, about carbon emissions, about a lot of issues. So uh, to, to bring them up to speed in terms of, of their competence uh, or, or enhance the level of competence is, in my opinion, very, 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 very crucial. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Um, the subject of steel and um, steel production uh, companies' competitiveness if they start to uh, eliminate greenhouse gases from the process came up. And I just wondered to what extent uh, the discussion in Sweden has looked at the potential advantage in being an early adopter of new methods. Uh, of producing steel, and this would apply to other industries as well, uh, given that whatever the shortcomings there may be of the Paris Agreement, it does create an international market in the longer term for new ways of production, and that therefore the early developers and adopters and owners of intellectual property associated with that have a huge commercial opportunity if they choose to take it. Although, arguably, it may be one of these uh, cases where those who are first to be second may have the advantage because of the huge start-up costs. So is that part of the discussion in Sweden? 
Absolutely. Definitely. No, I mean, that, that's one of the arguments that uh, a small country um, must, must uh, uh, give priority to. Um, I mean, our, our share of global emissions is, is, is very, very mm. small. Mm. Mm. Where we can make a difference is to demonstrate good solutions and then also benefit from trade in the, in the future. You know, Sweden produces roughly 5 million tons of steel, mostly special steel, yearly. The world production is 1.6 billion tons, half of that in China. So we have a long way to go uh, until uh, all those old steel producing facilities are closed down mm. and, and replaced by, by modern technology. But we have to start somewhere. Mm. And I think this, the Swedish um, um, hydrogen project, a similar project in Austria and one in, in, in Germany, are all very, very promising. So, so, so we hope that this, this, will, this will really give us benefits in the future. Mm. And we also have a history in this sense, uh, building upon what Anders just said, that you know, in, in, uh, after the oil crisis and when the shipyard crisis came up in the late 70s, we were a large ship producer and we produced lots of steel for the ship industry, but also bulk steel. We were a large producer at that time. China wasn't at all as large as they are today and India neither. But there was an enormous cost crisis in the Swedish steel industry. We had to close down lots of facilities and the ones that are now still in the market ask themselves at that time, what can we do to continue to be in the market in 10 or 20 or 30 years time? And they came up with, instead of building, uh, producing bulk steel, they went into producing special steel only. Very hard steel, very specialized products for the markets and very light steel for the car industry, for the Anders iPhones industry. Uh, and so forth, and they manage to stay in the market, and they're not so sensitive to price issues any longer. Now we can see that runners-up are following the Swedish example. We're not alone there any longer in that segment of the market. So this is a natural, innovative step to take things further in the steel industry. And we can't be sure that the first one is the winner. We don't know how the Porter hypothesis really works in reality. It works differently within different sectors. But we know that innovation is the key to our continued well-being and economic prosperity in Sweden. Nobody doubts that any longer. So that's why we're going into this project. Uh, thank you, convener. And developing this uh, theme of innovation, you mentioned a moment ago the hydrogen project in, in Sweden and, and Germany. Um, and in terms of train, uh, particularly, um, the development of fuel source for trains electric versus hydrogen. I understand that in Germany, Alstom have introduced, introduced uh, hydrogen trains. Do you see that as the future? Where do, how do you see hydrogen versus electric developing as, as, a, as a source of, of fuel for, for large vehicles or even cars? Well, I, I, I would say the best to ask is probably the Japanese because they have a huge emphasis given to hydrogen in, in parts of, of, of the Japanese uh, industry. Um, and quite obviously, they, they believe that hydrogen is going to be um, as good an alternative as electricity, both for, for private vehicles, but in particular for, for heavy traffic. Train, I think we will, we will rely on, on uh, the electric grid there. Uh, I, I don't see any reason. You know, we have we have 60, 70 terawatt hours every year from hydrogen, and now, as Stefan said, increasingly wind. I don't see any reason why we should why we should go for hydrogen there. But heavy traffic is 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 a bit special. So so I think there the the the, the question is still very open. It is very open, and uh, just to elaborate a little bit on on this industry, and especially one of our our largest energy producers, or the by far, by far the largest, Vattenfall, they started to, to, to discuss in terms of power to X instead of only power to gas as before. We can see that hydrogen is somewhat the future because there are so many possible ways to use it. Uh, in trains, we'll see we have some trains that can't be electrified with, within the northern parts of Sweden in the inland because there's no facilities there and it's going to be much too expensive to, to, to 
to, to construct electric, electricity there. So perhaps this could be an alternative to continue running the trains on diesel up there. It's not a very big part, but still. Cars, heavy vehicles, and we can also see that you can produce methanol for shipping by using hydrogen. And uh, there is possibilities also of using the, uh, <coughs> the bio CO2, uh, CO2 emissions that comes from the, from the uh, forest industry. There's already a project for that between the forest industry and Vattenfall to produce meth methanol for, for shipping on the Swedish West Coast. We'll see how that works out. And it's also the fact that as we go into a situation with more weather-dependent electricity production, we see that when windmills are becoming like 250 degrees high, they tend to produce much more wind than they uh, electricity than they did before because it's always some kind of wind up there. Yep. But we're still all going into a situation with more weather-dependent electricity. And then if you produce hydrogen as a backup gas for power stations, for instance, this could also go in as a balanced power when there is no wind and so the sun is not shining. So, yes, there is an, an increasing discussion on power tracks also in Sweden, but we haven't seen too much of it materialised as of yet. Thanks so much. Thank you. Finlay Carson. Uh, just very briefly to take us back to, to targets, um, and a, a simple question. Why uh, was a domestic effort target considered necessary alongside the overall target? What? what? Please repeat that question. Uh, why is a domestic effort target considered to be necessary along with the overall target? You mean the overall target in Europe or...? Uh, in Sweden. So you mean the division between the ETS sector and the rest of the economy? Yeah, and why, why you actually had a, a domestic target included in that? Well, I mean, I mean, ETS covers 45% of emissions, but the rest we have to deal with in Sweden. I mean, need policies, we need uh, a, a lot of, of a combination of regulation and incentives. Otherwise, uh, we believe emissions would not come down. So, so you need to address both this, uh, the sort of ETS sector and the non-ETS sector. That, that's, that's a given. And I think every, every country in the world has to do this. There's no way, there's no escape there. Okay. okay. Richard Lyle. Ah, good morning, gentlemen. <clears throat> right, can we look at your targets? Your targets are, of course, set in the future. So let's look to the future. In relation to the net zero 2045 target, do you really expect Sweden to use international carbon trading or other measures to achieve this? And if you did... What are the consequences of not meeting your net zero 2045 target and using carbon trading to meet your targets? Mm. There's been an intense discussion on international uh, trading or off offset mechanisms in Sweden. And there's been a tendency before uh, the agreement that we now have on the table on the 2045 goals between the various blocks within Swedish policy making, where the red greens has not been in favor of using credits, whereas the blue parties more or less wanted to, to uh, you know, use it a bit more. But now we have a very clear cut distinction and it's said that only 15% could be used in 2045. And it's not the said that is only credits that can be used for achieving those extra 15%. That is not necessarily reductions at home. It could also be land use and land use change issues, like an increased uptake in, in a large forest, depending on what is decided upon through the mechanisms of the Paris Agreement, since the Kyoto Protocol would run out you know, of definitions for what, what's going to be accepted as a credit in, in only a couple of years' time. And... Uh, we'll see what happens. The consequences you asked, if you don't... Was that... Your question, what happens if you don't reach? Yeah, to... what, what, what really happens, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're all setting targets well, well uh, in 20-odd uh, 20, 20 years' time. I think I'll be about 93 or something. Um, so, you know, it's great to set targets now as politicians, 
that we won't have to meet because we won't be here, possibly. Um, so why is it, you know, that, and also, um, is it not really a, sorry to use the word, a cop-out by uh, saying, well, if we don't meet it, we'll just buy credits and offset it. Is that not debasing your, your belief in what you think you're going to be able to do? Well, 2045 is a long time from now. As exactly. You say, stay tuned. <laughs> and what's happening now is that this is as far as we came during the investigation that Anders and I led together. What's happening at the moment is that the government, with the memory of the opposition, everybody wants this, is that they've launched an investigation on precisely these 15%. How do we best uh, create a, a, you know, a, a roadmap for how to use them? Because there is a certain amount that can be used for reaching the target in 2030 as well. And we have to elaborate on that. We didn't come further than this in, in our investigation. So now it's being done in another investigation and we'll see what they come up uh, with. And I, I would also say that, you know, we know very little about the next 20 to 25 years. So we have to maintain flexibility. And five years from now, we may have breakthroughs in certain technology areas, which, which will make uh, uh, the picture uh, look very, very different. Uh, the challenge look very different. I would do say though, that I, I do think that offsetting can play a very important role. And I know that the German government is going to launch a major initiative in Katowice, because I've been involved in discussions about it, where they will try to incentivize offsetting in many developing countries, helping civil society organizations, but also governments to, uh, re, uh, to restore degraded land, to uh, grow forests, etc., uh, build carbon in the soil, literally. Um, and, and, and that is something that the potential to do that is enormous. It's enormous, and, and we don't talk much about it because we have been so focused on the energy system, but, but degraded land, there are hundreds of millions of hectares that could be brought into fertility again and, and store carbon. So I think offsetting is an interesting area. Uh, can, I, can I say to you both, I do remember the, the 70s oil crisis. Um, I was in Holland at the time. Um, <clears throat> can I... I, it would be wrong of me not to ask this question. Some people might think I shouldn't be, but you spoke about recycling. Um, can you tell me if your deposit return scheme contributes or not to your carbon targets? Recycling? Yes. Your deposit return scheme. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, we have one chapter in the climate strategy that we, uh, we submitted that focuses on basic materials. And there you have a combination of innovation, substitution, and recycling. And I would say reuse. Recycling is the, the least positive alternative. Reuse of components is, is of course, the, the main target. The problem today is that most products are designed in a way that recycling and reuse is very difficult. Mm -hmm. I was chairing the Swedish Recycling Industry Association for six years. And one of the main problems was really that upstream they put things on the market that downstream is very difficult to do much about. So when ministers go to Brussels and enhance recycling rates, I very often said that's meaningless as long as you don't address the design issue as well. So I think there should be a principle uh, that norm, the, in, in, nor, in the normal case, when you put the product on the market, it should be relatively easy to reuse and recycle the components in that, in, in that product. And we need a revolution. Uh, we, I was part to a study done by a company called Material Economics. We can share it with you recently. And they, their estimate for the European Union was that by, by adopting a circular economy approach, we could cut away roughly 70% of the emissions with regard to basic materials and infrastructure leading up to 2050 compared to a business as usual case. So that is huge, but it's not happening as long as the European Commission doesn't take the, 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 the right measures. And unfortunately, Mr. Juncker is not the right man for the job because he is blocking, he is blocking to use the Eco Design Directive in an effective way. Thank I you. could elaborate on that. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Because you know why? You know why? In the Brexit campaign, Nigel Farage was traveling around Britain with a toaster in his hand, and he said, these bureaucrats in Brussels, they even have views on how we should design our toasters. Such rubbish. Uh, and that argument obviously was quite effective. And when Juncker heard that, he said, okay, let's focus on the big things, not on the small things. What he doesn't understand, obviously, is that if 500 million Europeans use a toaster which demands less electricity, that's a big thing. That's not a small thing. So the eco-design directive is very, very important, and we should broaden it to take into account design the materials. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Ruskell. I'm sorry Thanks. for being so political. <laughs> No more of it, please. <laughs> um, so you have one of the world's most ambitious climate targets, uh, net zero by 2045. Uh, there is some uncertainty there, though, isn't there, in terms of sitting here right now in 2018, exactly how you, how you get there. Uh, there's some uncertainty around the types of technological change that, that will be needed. Uh, how have you kind of dealt with that question? Um, because it is a big question here as we look at our own climate targets about whether we should have a very precise, thought-out pathway to whatever target we, we put into our own bill, or, or whether we, to a certain extent, take a leap of faith in the technology that might be coming and, and try and lean into that and develop that over time. How has that debate played out in, in Sweden? Well, I, I, I would say that, I mean, the first step, necessary step, is to set the targets. Then the devil is in the implementation. And uh, what we have seen over the last couple of years, both at the national level and at the city level or municipality level, is quite a lot of initiatives to try to, to, to come closer to the targets. So, so, so far, so good. Uh, emissions are unfortunately still, as right now, increasing, as a matter of fact. The last year, they are increasing. So they should start to go down. But a lot of measures have been implemented that should bring down emissions. But uh, we have to do much more. And after the IPCC report the other week, um, I think we should, uh, we should increase our ambition there. Hmm. Well, it's a good question, sir. Uh, as you can see, uh, can, can you see what I'm sharing with mm -hmm. you? Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, the, ye the yellow curve is actually emissions for obvious reasons. They're not as nicely, you know, uh, they don't perform as nicely as the trajectories does. <laughs> they go up and down, and we have no idea how they're going to go next year for obvious reasons. And we, we see that so far we've managed like minus 2% per year, it says, until 2017. <laughs> Last year we had a very rough winter, very cold winter, so emissions went up from that sector, but also industry is riding, running very warm, very high on, on, on a high percentage of its capacity, so that's the, the other explanation. And we see that we need to come down by 5%, between 5 and 8% uh, till 2045. 8% per year if we want to reach zero emissions and use none of the extra flexibility that we're allowed to. Otherwise, 5% per year. And, you know, if you don't make any calculations, or you, I think we, we need to set targets, then you need to evaluate, and then you need perhaps to, to put in more measures if you see that, that you don't reach the, the targets. And when you set the targets, at least we saw that the technology is around the corner or it's already there, perhaps not all, always on the market, but then you need to be a little bit bold to stretch things a little bit, but not too much. And we can see that minus 85% is within reach to, to, to 2045. It's not going to come, come around easily. We're going to have, have to make more, take more measures to, to get there and incentivize sometimes and also we're going to need to have a discussion on how to look up on fossil fuels, for instance, for the transport sector after like 20, 2030. Should we have a very high tax on them in order for them not to return when electricity has become the main fuel? Or should we simply forbid them on the market? We, we don't know that. But, you know, we, we know very little about the future. Set the targets, evaluate and take more measures as we have the evaluation at hand. That's the way we do it. Yeah. Two more <clears throat> additional comments. One is that I don't think any European country has cut their emissions by more than 1.5 to 2 percent from one year to the, to the next, in, historically. 
So this means that whether we talk about five or eight percent per year, that that is a huge difference. And and again, I want to stress in many sectors, it's transformation we are talking about to do things differently. Secondly, we have, of course, we're going to face stranded assets along the road and we have to put the policy in place, not only in Sweden, but in particular in Central Europe for regions which are very much stuck in the, in the coal based economy to help them uh, transform. And I don't think we have discussed that uh, in, in sufficiently yet, neither in, at the national level nor at the European level. So I think that's, that, that, that has to come. I, I read that um, you have your, your 15 sector action plans, and we've heard a bit this morning about cement and steel uh, and other sectors. But, uh, I mean, how focused are these sector action plans on, on the gap, if you like? Um, because there will, of course, be things that you know, and you know, we've heard about the, um, the transformation in renewable heating, and you know, that's obviously a, an easier target for you and the progress you've made in renewable electricity. But in terms of those harder to breach, um, Gaps. I mean, is there innovation coming from these sector action plans that give you confidence and the public confidence that the gap can be closed, or are there still many unanswered questions there? Well, let, let me start and say that uh, one of my tasks now is to chair Climate Kick, which is one of the instruments put up by the European Commission some years ago. Kick stands for Knowledge and Innovation Communities, uh, and uh, after seven, eight years of experience, we have come to the conclusion that in order to bring about transformation, we really need what we call systems design, not vertical or, or silo-based design. So we are no longer interested primarily in specific technologies. We look at the system and to try to understand what is required within the system to really make change happen. So I think that that is going to be, uh, when, when we talk about innovation, I think of course, there are, there are areas where a particular technology can make uh, significant change. <clears throat> but if we talk about transportation, if we talk about <clears throat> infrastructure, if we talk about farming, you need to look at a number of components to make change happen. And, and here I think uh, we, we need to be much, much more uh, ambitious and, and uh, put... Um, public funding in support of that. Mm. I shared with you a couple of the action plans. Perhaps you have them all. Otherwise, I'd be happy to share them with you. You asked, sir, if they were focused on the gap. And I'd say that not necessarily so, per se. Uh, they, they have rather showed an initiative to, um, to come up with action plans for their own spectrum and see how fast can we translate today's emissions into becoming fossil free. But as it happens, the fossil free coordinator appointed by the Swedish government has worked with those sectors that needs to be focused on to close our gap. You can see that, for instance, mining and minerals industry is there and they'll try to make mining operations fossil free by 2035. They are large emitters. And they also have working machines down the mines that emits lots of CO2, which is often a forgotten sector. And they're about to become electrified around the corner. It will happen, well, from next year, actually. And I think that they're going to reach this goal much sooner than 2035, actually. Steel industry, 10% of the Swedish emissions. Aviation industry, an obviously sticky issue, to use the word of the community before. And also lots of other sectors that really are in the focus of where Sweden needs to take action to close our gap. So... Yes and no. No, because they focus on their own sectors, but yes, it happens to be those sectors chosen by the, the uh, coordinator appointed by the government and closely in contact with us doing, carrying out the anal analytical work for the government. Could I just follow up on that? So the, the, the strategy, the government strategy of not including certain sectors when they're measuring or producing their targets or measuring their achievements in relation to those targets. I mean, that's um, quite different from the Scottish approach where we are setting a target which doesn't exclude any sector. Can you see a, a situation where Sweden adopts that? Is that politically possible? Um, is, that, is that necessary if we're to be bolder? 
Uh, could you repeat the question, please? I didn't quite understand. So, uh, at, the, at the moment, your government set, sets um, their targets, but it doesn't include things like aviation, for example. It doesn't include certain land use em em emissions. But Scotland's approach is differing in that it isn't, isn't excluding any sectors. Does yeah. Well, that, that, so that, can you see a, there been a political change in order to not excluding these sectors and making your targets more kind of, you know, hundred percent of sectors? Well, you know, I, I think the the two sectors that are not included is aviation and shipping. Yeah. Um, but the conscious of the fact that we have to include them uh, sooner or later. Yeah. Um, but. They were seen as being part of the international agreement uh, domain. Um, but I agree with you. We, 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 we need to tackle them and uh, we need to take initiatives. And uh, I think that if every country would wait for, for the others to join, nothing would happen. So, so some countries would have to stick their neck out and, and, and be a bit more ambitious. So I, I very much applaud the, the Scottish um, approach. We haven't come that far yet, but, but I think we will come there. OK. Stuart Stevenson. Um, just looking at the document that's just disappeared off the screen, it, it said that aviation aims to have domestic flights by 2030 um, emission-free and international flights originating in Sweden to be emissions-free by 2045. Now, I read that as being the industry's aims, what status does that have and what, how, how do they sanction themselves if they, if they don't do it? And does it mean very much if it's not part of the legislative framework? Well, in a, in a way, uh, first about international aviation, you know, all aviation within Europe is obviously part of the ETS system. So that part of our flying system is in the system, the domestic system. Well, uh, but then international flights are, are outside, just to be clear on that. And all sectors are part of the Swedish goals. I mean, except for those ones. So, I mean, the haulage industry, the retail sector, uh, the steel sector, mining and minerals, they are within the 85%. So the status of their goals is more or less, you know, a statement on their behalf to their owners, to their consumers, to the society in general, but, but then again, they're not connected in any particular way to the goals set out by the government. Uh, and what the government can do is more to incentivize them than anything else. So, so that would be my answer. Then, then again, try to find a picture here. You know, we don't calculate any of any, uh, the uptake from our forests. In Sweden, we emit around 55 million tons of CO2 each year, and the uh, net uptake from our forest is around 45 to 50 million tons. So, you know, we don't calculate that at, at, at all. We could, of course, do that as well, and I wasn't really sure when I read your papers how Scotland does with this, but we oh, don't yes. at all. We might begin to do so in the future, but currently we look upon it as a free service to, to the world, so to speak. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Um, we've developed some of these um, issues in our discussions already, but um, I'd just like to highlight that, um, as you'll know, Stefan Nystrom in indicated in his Scotsman article that the setting of a net zero target had been a strong driver for business and local government. Um, in Scotland, you will probably know that we have um, now mandatory uh, duties for um, public bodies, not just local government, but all public bodies in, in the public sector. Um, but this is a, a, an expectation rather than a support, although there are support methods. I'm just wondering what support, um, beyond what we've already discussed, you could, either of you could highlight that's provided by central government um, in Sweden for either the public sector or business to achieve climate change targets. Well, I mean, we, we alluded to the steel sector where the government yeah. puts in some uh, 
30, 40 million euros yearly for, for that uh, hydrogen project. Um, so there are many examples like that. Yes. Then, of course, there are particular incentives in the transportation sector that, that, that Stefan uh, alluded to, uh, both to um, incentivize consumers to do certain things, but also uh, to obliging um, uh, the, the, the petroleum providers to gradually uh, increase the, the, um, the mixing of uh, synthetic fuels into conventional fuels, etc. So there, 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 there is a there is a whole array of, of different uh, measures. We could, of course, send them over to you, but I don't think we could. Could, could give an exhaustive list here. No, 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 that would be very helpful. Thank you. And the public sector is obviously very important as well. You know, the local government um, arrangements and and other things such as the health service or the police or how, how is, is the Swedish government able to support those in, in affecting change? Well, there is a, there is a provision in the law that each and every government sector, each ministry, has to take into account the, the climate law in all what they're doing. Mm -hmm. so, so climate mitigation and adaptation concerns have to be um, taken into account in all policy making. And that's one of the, I think, strong parts of the legislation. And that, that uh, makes um, this this law much more integrating than what we've had in the past. Then, as I said, at the municipality level, you have a lot of examples of uh, rather ambitious policies, uh, engaging the private sector, engaging different parts of the municipality services, etc. Uh, so, so uh, and, and there is sort of a, almost a competition, uh, both Domestically, but also internationally, you have the C40, you have the ECLA, you have a lot of organizations at, at the city level who, who cooperate and who, 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 who share best experiences, etc. So, so that, that's going on, and, and that doesn't need much uh, the national level. Yeah. As I just said, there's a lot of support programs. We can't go into them all. You wouldn't want us to, I think, but we can send them over to you in text and you can read about them and ask questions later on if you'd like. Uh, also, several cities have, have you know, introduced their own climate change committees. So there's about three Swedish cities who've come up with their own climate change committees. So, you know, things are really developing at a very fast pace. Then again, as I understated earlier, one of the big challenges is that we traditionally work very much in silos, as is the case in all countries, I guess, both within governments, but also within communities. And just to take an example to, to see the challenge ahead of us is that when government um, introduced or launched, we have, a, we have an infrastructure investment program, which is financed by the government, but which is, you know, so, uh, I think there's some sound in the background where you are, which makes it difficult for us to hear. It's a scraping sound. Anyway. I don't think it's here. Um, are you... Just carry on. We can hear you perfectly. Okay, good. That was some scraping sound from your side. Anyway, it stopped now. Thank you. But, you know, when, when this program was launched last year, it's a 10-year program for how much Sweden is supposed to invest in new roads, new railroads and surveillance and ma no, maintenance and so forth. Uh, this program comprised some 690 billion Swedish crowns, which is about 75 billion pounds, so lots of money. But, but so far, the um, authorities that were responsible for elaborating on where to put, to put the money, they didn't even consider the climate. So this was just to give evidence of, no, we have a, a way to, to walk as well. And we have to, you know, find the way to cooperate between the silos. And we're not there yet. As I understand, there is an important provision in the law to do so. Mm. But it remains to materialize to a large extent. Thank you. Okay. Alec Rowley. I wonder, um, my experience has been that many more people are aware of climate change, but there is a tendency sometimes that they see it as someone else's problem to solve. 
And I wonder your experience of engaging the wider public within this discussion and debate and for them to see that, that we all have a responsibility. And can you also, going back to this question of setting a net zero target, there is the debate in Scotland uh, about whether it's achievable and, and whether it's the right thing to do. What is the advantage or the main advantage you would see in setting a set, a, a, a set zero target, given that the technology, et cetera, that, that we would perhaps need to achieve that is not yet invented? Mm, well, I, 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 first, first, your first question. Of course, there are groups in, in this country as well as in other countries who are either climate deniers, we have those people, or very skeptical to a small country like Sweden taking on this ambitious goal. Um, so you have, of course, to, to talk to them and you have to try to make the point that if we do the transition or transformation in an intelligent way, these groups, and most of them, if I may try to categorize them, I, I think they live in the rural areas. Um, and they have a tendency also nowadays to vote for the um, ultra-right party that's uh, emerged over the last 10, 15 years. You have to convince them or show to them that if we do this transformation in, in an intelligent way, they should not become losers, rather the opposite. Because we would, we would do a lot of things uh, within the context of a bio-based economy that, that would probably be beneficial to them. So I think... Um, it's very important to uh, establish a dialogue with people and uh, not to, to look upon uh, anyone as a hopeless case, rather engage everybody. Otherwise, this is not going to succeed. Mm. Uh, then, um, you know, I, I think the only way to address this issue, which is an existential issue, I would say, uh, if you read the IPCC report, that came out on Dr. Great carefully, not only the summary for policymaker, but some of the, the uh, other uh, chapters, you, you will see that between 1.5 and 2 degrees, there are possible tipping points that are very, very serious. So, and, and that, that may turn life as we know it into becoming very, very difficult and challenging. Only a few decades from now, uh, so, so I think we need to put these very ambitious goals. Um, and we have so far a lot of evidence that, that when we do that, we can also achieve it. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I think it's cool. Uh, and in most areas, we have the technologies. We have the technologies. And then if we add behavioral change, I mean, it's not a godsend right to travel to Thailand every Christmas on vacation people could start uh, reconsidering some of their uh, habits. And, and, and I think that would be needed. So um, that would be my answer. Yeah. No, this is a intensive important, one of the most important issues, because if the, the general public is not aware and does not support, then it's going to be very difficult for the politicians to set measures in place in order to achieve the goals. I think there's a very strong consciousness since ever of environmental and last summer, as I also wrote in the article, uh, after that, discussions have gone very intense, have become very intense. You know, we haven't had this uh, dry, this hot summer ever before. It was something extraordinary. Harvests were halved, you know? And in spite of that, we had a very cold winter with lots of rains and floods. And at the same time as we, we have flooding at five to ten places, and at the same time we had severe drought. And it served no one. And everybody understood that this, if this is the beginning, uh, we really need to, to put an extra effort in. Now, asking your question about net zero and the advantage of a net zero target, I'd say it's that net zero, or for that matter, fossil free, it's much easier to communicate to anyone than 86% or 93% or whatever percentage. Because percent, what is a percent? What is 80? What is 90? What is net zero? That's something to stand behind. That's an Apollo project. 
launch him out of the and that's something which is needed in this kind of enormous transition that we stand before. And, you know, we started on philosophy that I think something which is discussed, at least uh, in some leading newspapers today in Sweden, is Kant's moral imperative. You need to do the right things because they are the right things to do. Thank you. And fi final question. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, I, 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 I had calculated we would end that. 11.30 or 10.30 your time, so I, I have to gradually start to phase out, but please, one question more. Okay, we have a final question from Richard Lyle. Yes, um, final question, gentlemen. I believe we all wish to be green, we all wish to secure the future. So can we now turn to the implementation costs and society cost? In Scotland, a figure of 13 billion has been given for the cost of implementing our proposed target. However, there are a number of unknown factors in the methodology and analysis. What analysis has been done to the costs and benefits of, Scot of Sweden's net zero target, and how robust do you believe it is? Well, I would say the economic models we have are not very good uh, at calculating this, in particular not over the long term. That was one of the findings when we had the strategy work. That, that and, and most of the economic modeling looks at the costs, not at the benefits. And they, they, they do not really have the capacity to anticipate the innovation that will probably take place as a consequence of the measures taken new companies being uh, started, new jobs coming uh, into f force, etc. So, so I would say that um, I, th I think you have to, to take all such calculations with a grain of salt. Mm. Uh, that's my sort of general answer. Mm. Secondly, um, of course, uh, it, 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 will, it will cost some money, but I think the benefits are colossal. And if you include the health-related benefits in most countries from less uh, air pollution, it's something that, 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 that will give huge benefits to society. So, so, so those would be my more general comments. Mm. Now, I agree with Anders. Being an economist myself, having done lots of modeling, it is difficult to get innovation into models in a proper way, which means that they're always overestimated cost and it's difficult at all. Since the whole scheme of becoming fossil free or climate neutral to 2045 depends on innovation and we can't get it into models, it's very difficult to calculate any numbers for it. Rather we can see from the other side what are the benefits and we can see that there are no regrets policies in many instances when it comes to electrification for instance. We have 1100 <laughs> Deaths, in a, you know, but pre, pre, what is it? They, um, people die 12 years in advance of what they should do in order to air pollution. So we're going to get cleaner cities, less noisy cities. We're going to be able to to construct buildings in areas where the noise is too high now, when elect, uh, electric cars are there instead of the fossil cars, and uh, making combustion. it off to combustion and just making it more possible to to uh, brighten up the cities. And land is very scarce in the centers of these areas. So there's lots of no regrets policies with, that we can identify here. And since, since industry itself, when it comes to the big polluters or big emitters like industry and cement, they see this as, as a competitive advantage in the future if we can find proper ways of sharing risk and finance with the public. That's what triggered, I think, the possibility of setting the goals. And everybody understood that you can't really calculate either costs for, for the measures to be taken or the costs of non-action for that matter either. You have to value it in relation to reality as it develops. But I would add two things. One is that nobody knows the extent of stranded assets out there. And I think the financial sector has only recently started to be aware that some of the things that they have invested may lose value because of technology change. Secondly, uh, we didn't have time to dwell into 
the whole area of exponential technologies. Um, I would submit that one of the most interesting and fascinating opportunities probably would be in trying to align climate policy with some of the exponential technologies that we now see emerging, particular digital technologies, artificial intelligence, etc. But most of those technologies are not really aiming at addressing climate mitigation goals. They, are, they, they, they aim at other objectives. And if we could align those, I think we, we would have some, some opportunities that we don't see today. Um, so, um, I mean, as we, as we have indicated, that there is so much that is unknown and that we have to explore. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank you both very much. We've kept you a lot longer than we, we thought, but we, you've been so interesting and you've answered our questions so fully. I want to thank the two of you for, 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 for staying on and, and giving us that evidence. has been tremendously useful. So I just want to, again, round up our, our, our public session by, by, by thanking uh, both uh, Stefan Neustrom and Anders uh, Vickman for all their time this morning. Um, at our next meeting on the 6th of November, the, the Committee will continue its consideration of the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Bill and will look at the behaviour changes and governance structures required to achieve more challenging climate change targets. And the Committee will now move into private session and I request that the public gallery be vacated as the public part of the meeting is now closed. Thank you to all. <laughs>